treatment. After the verdict begins a series of acts in the name of correction, for nature's error cannot be left to its own machinations, so you marshal your own mechanics into a hard solution of gear and gravity. Really a tissue of theories stretch like my body on the rack that at first feels like some, something like pleasure. When the spaces between the vertebrae expand against the ill will of time, whose years are compressed into minutes, but the relief slips like the discs back into an inaccessible place, indexed only by a species of cry that permits no escape other than in viced gasps that remind you reluctantly when to stop. This is part of a chaplet, and I say chaplet rather than chapbook because it's a essentially a six poem series uh, that reflects on my experience going through uh, chiropractic treatment uh, roughly in 2010. Um, I went to go get my first x-rays of my scoliosis, uh, and I started going to see a chiropractor who was in many ways uh, experimenting with different ways of sort of trying to alleviate my pain. Um, and I wanted to think about what it meant to have my spine manipulated and to sort of put myself in someone else's care when my spinal curvature was something that I didn't really address up until that moment to sort of feel medicalized, to feel like my spine had errors or deformities that needed to be corrected. That to me was a very strange experience. I finally had a name for the, the particular um, experiences I was going through. Uh, and I wanted to write from the subjectivity of medicalization or, or being a subject of medicalization and think about this kind of linear process of, of figuring out what it is I had all the way to the end with treatment. So I uh, the, the poems, this entire sequence begins with diagnosis and it ends with uh, a kind of cheeky uh, poem called Second Opinion in which I essentially, after all of that treatment, I still needed to find more answers about my chronic conditions. So from a disability poetic standpoint, I wanted to experiment a lot with form. Um, how, how can pain, for instance, shape the lines that I write? Uh, a poem that came right before this called prognosis the line breaks are everywhere that every moment that I experience pain in com composing this poem um, so I wanted to experiment a lot with the actual composition of the work itself um, how do I sort of sit beside pain inhabit pain in the process of poetic production but also to speak back to medicalization and the way that medicine shapes disabled experience if that makes sense It, it's actually uh, a reference to two different shapes in my head. So I have uh, kyphoscoliosis. So I both have a rounding of my spine, but it also curves. So I have the classic reverse S shape. Um, and this, this uh, the, the poem is in one single stanza and this stanza is in the shape of the first curve in my back. Uh, but also one of the things I'm referencing um, in one of the lines where I refer to as uh, my body on the rack, um, I was put into this machine that uh, essentially has like a strap around the, the your waist and the machine moves back and forth. And what it does is it pulls um, your back and spine to create space between the discs and the vertebrae, um, which alleviates pressure. Um, and the machine looks very much like this. Um, so I wanted, I felt like it was a sort of double reference that I could make on a sort of spatial level and a formal level uh, rather than just the content. This is a great question. And honestly, my memory is now slipping away from me. But I will say, in this was the poem. So in the in the series, it is the third poem, but it was, I believe, the poem I wrote first, uh, where I was trying to grasp at what it is that troubled me about my experience. Uh, it's the fact that treatment is the one that felt most actively trying to correct, or in this case, felt violent in in my experience um so for me the form actually took a little bit i wrote this as uh at first a series of uh, it was actually a, a prose sentences and i realized i needed to winnow it down into something um that 
match the other poems in this series. Uh, but also, um, I, I, there was something about removing the punctuation that helped me visualize this poem a little bit differently. It's actually really interesting that you asked this question, um, because I've been thinking a lot about that dynamic in my in my lived experience. So I, I remember when I was first undergoing this treatment that at first felt almost kind of medieval in the way that I was being strapped into this thing that was like literally pulling my spine, uh, elongating my spine. Um, I was at first disturbed by it, and it was slightly painful at first, but I remember that moment when my spine um, sort of quote unquote was unpacked is the word. Um, and it felt it felt very much like an easing of that pain almost instantly. And I remember that pleasure being not only seductive, but also um, something I'd not felt before. And I wanted to deal with that ambivalence. Um, and something that I've been working through a lot now is chronic pain, particularly pain that does not have an easy solution or can be medicalized away is something that we see as an undesirable state of being. What does it mean to think about pain and its relationship to pleasure? Um, and I'm thinking here of one of my colleagues' works, um, uh, Emma Shepard, who is working on a sort of BDSM culture uh, and thinking about how for many disabled people in pain, uh, a sort of redeveloping a relationship to pain that is also pleasurable has been really empowering. And I've been thinking a lot about that in my personal life now. So at the time I was writing this poem, this was, oh goodness, um, toward graduate school when I was still a, kind of a closeted poet who was afraid to share his work. Um, I was reading a lot of theory. Uh, at the time I was reading um, Susan Sontag's Illness as Metaphor from the 80s, where she essentially says the, the healthiest way of being ill is one that is completely purged of metaphor. And of course, in literally within the first page of, of her treatise, she uses metaphor. And that irony, I think, is really interesting where metaphor is so endemic to the way we use language, particularly talking about illness and disease. Uh, but metaphor can be really dangerous. Um, and Sontag talks about it in terms of the military metaphor, where we use this language of fighting cancer or, you know, the the battle against a, a particular disease or condition. And I, I was really thinking about the dangers of metaphor and how, particularly in disability context and, and disability poetics more broadly, disability gets deployed in metaphorical ways that actually reinforce sort of ableist stereotype or are used in stigmatizing ways. And I wanted to challenge myself a little bit to not just be judicious about when I use metaphor, but what kinds of metaphor I am perpetuating in my own account of disability. Um, when it comes to pain, a lot of the metaphors we use regarding pain have very violent connotations, um, hammering, um, sort of uh, this uh, stabbing. It's a very violent set of vocabularies for pain. Uh, and I've been trying to sort of take the take the the warning seriously that metaphor while it can create connection across seemingly disparate concepts can actually produce unintended consequences and that's not to say i don't i've jettisoned metaphor for my for my poetic practice but i've just been very deliberate about what that metaphor is achieving so to speak Because pain suffuses almost every aspect of my life, I feel like it's the word that just so naturally comes out in any description of, of suffering or discomfort. So one of the challenges I had, I had not imagined this poetic series in this way yet, but I was finding that in my work, I was pushing, pushing against this need to name pain as pain because it was so overdetermined. And I was thinking about this, I've reflected about uh, reflected on this in, in several places publicly about the way that pain, the narrative surrounding pain get sort of prescriptive when it comes to people of particularly marginalized identities. So when I talk about pain as a queer person, uh, as a Chinese American person, there's already preconceived notions about what my pain looks like and how I need to trot out that pain for particular purposes. 
and and for those of us in the publishing industry, uh, the, certain kinds of pain are more marketable than others. And we can talk about how objectifying that is. But what I found myself doing was really resisting this impulse to sort of name a pain as a thing that will in many ways overdetermine what the work of this set of poems or even that poem is doing. The more sophisticated answer that I'm going to try to give um, is one that's, again, related to theory. Um, at the time, I was also reading um, uh, Elaine Scarry's book, The Body and Pain. Um, and that book had a profound influence on me sort of understanding what pain does and understanding why I had such a difficult time expressing it to other people. So um, Scarry's claim in 1985 was that uh, pain is this inexpressible thing that cannot be communicated across uh, individuals and actually shatters language. Um, and for me, I was disturbed by that because it, for me, I felt like what, what was really happening was that we actually don't have robust languages to encompass the many, many experiences of pain. We actually don't listen well enough to people in pain. It's not that pain destroys language. I think the, the people that I know that I have chronic pain, myself included, actually are very effusive and descriptive about their pain. Um, so part of what I was trying to do in this project was sort of push back against this notion that pain absolutely destroys our capacity to speak about it. Uh, but actually, how can we think about talking about pain without having to use pain as the sort of signifier for that set of experiences, if that makes sense? I think you've identified a question that for me is one that I'm still working out as I'm beginning to publish my work and, and having my name circulate in ways that I didn't expect. So when I think about this concept of marketable pain, I think a lot about the way that it's associated with trauma and what Joseph Shapiro has described as the kind of model of disability uh, that we, I think in, in the field, refer to as inspiration porn, or the idea that disabled people need to be inspirations, overcoming that pain, that language of overcoming um, is so pervasive that I think decades of disability scholarship and disability literature and writing has tried to push back against. But there is, I think, a lot of publication incentive um, in the form of book deals or in the form of being placing your work in major publications that want disabled people um, and people of color and queer people to rehearse a kind of trauma that is often extreme about sort of social rejection, violence, um, and I've, I've always been really disturbed by this, right, that the people who have experienced forms of oppression, uh, extreme oppression, are often asked to narrate that oppression as some sort of truth claim about their marginality, right? Oh, these people are oppressed. Let's have them explain to us just how oppressed they really are. Second, as a way of sort of... Um, creating more space at the table, I'm seeing a lot of these movements toward diversity, equity, and inclusion that are predicated on these marginalized groups saying that they are oppressed, trotting out their traumas in order to have a place at the table, rather than embracing, say, a disabled poet not writing about disability or not writing about disability in negative ways, right? What would it mean to talk about disability as pleasure? There seems to be less of a space for that um, in publication spaces than I would have expected. Um, that's not to say it doesn't exist. I'm thinking about Alice Wong's new book where she talks a lot about pleasure and disability, but there needs to be this element of, of um, stigma, oppression, and overcoming um, that that gets you in the door, so to speak. And I'm, I'm, I've always been really troubled by that. And I don't think that's going to go away, even as disability and disability writing sort of comes into the mainstream. <laughs> 